So I'm just going to have a little colloquy, which is a fancy word for conversation that someone just taught me. Um, but I just had the privilege of reading Paul's most recent book, Conversation, and it's, as I was telling him, I spend most of my time trying to stay out of politics and religion, and this book is really a theological um, set of conversations with uh, Father Gustavo Gutierrez and Paul, kind of the founder of modern liberation theology and one of its principal um, implementers in the real world and what that looks like. So I guess my first question would be kind of the reconciling the personal and the professional, the policy and the personal, um, standing in solidarity with the poor, it's, it's an abstract concept that um, everyone here is probably against poverty, right? Um, there's not a pro-poverty camp. But how do you take that and put it into action and build a career and a movement? How do you do that? It's, I wish there were a multiple choice answer for that. C. <laughs> you know, uh, um, first of all, thank you um, for having me back here. I am staying with some friends of mine uh, who live in, in the neighborhood, the Kellys, and I was speaking as if I'd been here a couple of years ago and said as much. And they said, you haven't been here in years. I said, well, surely that's a bit of an exaggeration. And uh, in fact, it has been a long time. And, uh, and the reason I had this illusion about proximity is because uh, Direct Relief has been so engaged with our work. Uh, and I think it's a, also not a bad segue into thinking about your question, meaning the work of Partners in Health, which is a partnership organization by definition, that's how it was founded, that's why it was founded, um, requires uh, solidarity, of course. You know, it's easy to say solidarity, and, or it's easy to say social justice, or it's sort of easy to say, I'm against poverty. And you won't find a lot of people, as you suggest, who say, well, I'm for poverty, against solidarity, and, uh, and you know, that disconnect, if, if so many people are against poverty and for solidarity and compassion and compassionate systems, how, well, how do we fall short? And one of the answers that, um, you know, I, I took from, among others, people like Father Gustavo Gutierrez was, there's got to be a way to take those notions and sentiments, solidarity, compassion for others, and link it to pragmatic engagement. And, you know, in medicine, uh, that, that work is very often cl clinical service. You know, your doctors aren't supposed to be confused, you know, who's sick and who's well, who, and, and, uh, but we do get confused. Uh, and, uh, and the same happens in, e in every field. But that link between sentiment, notion, abstract ideals, and actually serving. I think uh, it's a way out of that trap. You know? and, and you said, well, how do you make a personal commitment? Uh, it's really not that you yourself, or you, Thomas, for example, or any, any of you in this room, uh, you know, have to, in order to be involved in this work of pragmatic solidarity, that you have to be doing that yourself, it's that you wish that it be done. And how we don't really use the subjunctive too much in English, it sounds kind of highfalutin. Like, what did you call it, colloquy or? Colloquy. colloquy. Um, so we wish, that, we wish that it be done. We, we want there to be uh, a pragmatic struggle against poverty and ill, Ill health. You can't do that without stuff. You need staff, stuff, support, uh, and uh, you know that's how we got connected to Direct Relief, and that's how we're connected to many people in this room. There's a, yes, a lot of people in the organization Partners in Health are frontline providers, uh, but they can't do their work without stuff. Um, there are deliverables for our work. So again, that sounds like a very pedestrian answer to your philosophical question. How do you link? you know, uh, personal engagement to these ideals. But one way is to do it humbly, you know, of uh, direct service provision. Now, of course, you can give bad service or stupid service. Wait, take that out, it sounds terrible. 
In other words, it is, it, is, it is true that you can give the wrong thing, the wrong diagnosis, the wrong care. I'm just using the medical example. You could, you can make, you, we make mistakes all the time. But the notion itself of caring enough to think about people's everyday concerns, you know, and they're, they're startlingly similar across the world. I just came back, as most of you did, yesterday from Siberia. <laughs> um, believe it or not, that only took two flights. That just shows... Ask the Kellys, it's true. Siberia. Yeah. Well, thank you for asking. I feel like I should repeat the question. I'm never going to give him the microphone back, by the way. It's only one microphone. Now, I, you know, if, thank you for asking. What was I doing in Siberia? Um, again, it's, a, I think, a good illustration. There, in, inside the, the prison, the penitentiary uh, system of Tomsk, which is a place in, the, in Siberia about the size of Poland, it's huge, huge, it's a state, of, you know, uh, maybe one and a half million people fewer. Um, we can say, oh, well, you know, we're, we're for the health and well-being of prisoners, you know, and, and to use some jargon, people get sent to prison as punishment, not for punishment, right? So you, 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 again, you won't find many people say, you know what? I think that we should send people to prison as punishment and for more punishment. That's, you're not going to find people, well, what if they're getting sick with tuberculosis because they're detained? Then to me that says they're getting punished twice. You know, say they are guilty. In Rwanda, probably 70% of the prisoners we saw in the first years who were there were, were guilty of being involved in genocide. But they didn't get sent to prison for more punishment, but rather as their punishment, they had their liberty taken away from them. So if you have epidemics or, or medical problems inside prison, then the, how do you go from those noble sentiments that you talked about uh, to um, actually doing your job? It's pragmatic services. Anyway, that's what we're doing in Russia too. Um, and we get that question a lot. Why are you working in Russia and the United States? They're rich countries, developed countries. They have things like warehouses and electricity, lots of electricity in the case of Russia, um, and gas. Did we mention gas? Um, so people ask us, why are you working there? And that's because there are people who are rendered sick because they're poor in rich countries as well. And uh, now that's three questions I answered, Thomas, for the, for the price of one. I'm going to pass this back to you so I'm not guilty of just like I said, I could sit here for hours and listen to my own voice with great delight. Everyone here has heard me. Believe me, that's what they came for. But, you know, one of the things that, that I picked up in, in your book, I, uh, I came back yesterday from uh, Geneva, New York, and it took me three flights to get here. And it was, it was snowing in Rochester to get out of here. Um, I was uh, speaking in front of the International Collegiate Debate Champions, and <clears throat> after first of all agreeing and then saying, but I won't take any questions, they said, no, this is the debate champions, they won't do it. And I said, well, I'm going to go interview Dr. Paul Farmer, so cut me some slack. They started cheering for you. The, uh, so it was, it was a nice, the following is, uh, is big. But one of the things in the book that I thought was, it struck me was there was a, uh, a passage about the commodification of medicine. So... Um, how we can, you know, we're good at these things, bringing things to scale. Um, business folks, that's always the first question. Sounds good, how do you bring it to scale? Makes me a little nervous sometimes, because sometimes you bring bad things to scale and you have to be really careful about it. But throughout the book and the conversations with Father Gutierrez, there's a soulful element that it just comes through. So beware of bringing something to scale in the, in the realm of public health and losing while you get into it for the first place. And I think we all see that in the international kind of development, it's, it's kind of a horrible lexicon and jargon. It seems increasingly divorced from this thing we learned in the sixth grade or fourth, first grade, really, about caring for people who are sick or hurt, which you've been able to reconcile those things too. But how do you maintain that sense that seems seemingly inherent in health, in health care, um, when the debate becomes so intensely political and people like tearing up the country and just projecting all of their political views on it, it seems like this notion that you've been able to retain uh, stays there. It's with all of your team of partners in health. And um, how, do you, how do you see that, kind of balancing the commodification 
which is good to extend the benefits of broader services and kind of standards uh, without losing the sense of why you get into it in the first place. Is that, I'm just trying to hear my own voice to, uh, for time parity, but is that a question that is worthy of a Paul Farmer response? Yeah, I think it's a great question. You know, um, the debate team would be cheering you if they'd heard that question. <laughs> By the way, it's another part of the, the um, I think, another part of going from solidarity to pragmatic solidarity is stuff. But I mentioned, you know, I mentioned staff. You know, it's a crass way of saying that is the human beings who who do the work and uh, and getting young people involved uh, is an important part of it. Um, and, and so that's why I'm um, gonna be at, at, at UC Santa Barbara later on and, and, and really glad that you went to Geneva, New York. Now I'm not familiar, that's probably the Siberia of the Nor North America, but uh, actually Siberia of North America is probably Minnesota. <laughs> We're not taping this, are we? Um, you know, uh, the, the question of scale, and I, I don't know the answer to any, any of these questions as if, again, it's please answer A, B, C, or all of the above, but I would say that there are two reasons to engage in, uh, with uh, public health in the sense of the public sector. and. Uh, one of them is when you talk about health as a human right, so who confers rights? What institutions confer rights? Not Partners in Health or Direct Relief or you know, Harvard University. You know, those are, by definition, non-governmental organization. You know, we have to find some way to work uh, with the public sector, which means the government. I mean, it's hard to imagine any, any, uh, any place, as my colleague Jenny Block, who uh, edited that book, as she said, point to a single country that has pulled itself out of poverty and fragility without some kind of commitment to the public sector. It's not that we do that, back to the subjunctive. It's not that um, I, I'm not saying I, that's what I want to do personally, but I wish that it be done. And uh, so the idea of the right to health care, and the right to health is another great idea. It's hard to imagine, well, how do you, how do you legislate the right to health? You know? But we can do better, surely, on the right to health care, you know, the deliverable, as they say in what I unfortunately called Silicon Valley. Everybody laughed as if it were a great joke. It was an accident. I was there when I said it. So the deliverable. The other reason to do it uh, is because of scale. And you know, that is bringing something to scale, even though it's, a, it's something people say um, without much reflection. You know, oh, we have to bring this to scale, or it's not to scale. That, by the way, is meant as a devastating critique. And, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's sometimes a devastating critique, and sometimes it's just a critique. You know, it's just people, you know, bashing uh, some group on the head for not being big enough. And I think the lessons of bringing the wrong things to scale are important. That's you know one of the things I try to struggle with in that book. Obviously, something can be dangerous and harmful or even murderous. Like you can bring a genocide to scale. That happened 20 years ago this week. It started in Rwanda. That was the 20th anniversary. And it's worth knowing these mistakes from the you know egregious and outrageous and criminal. But there are also mistakes that we all make, like getting the wrong therapy and pushing so hard to bring it to scale that we haven't done enough to think about how to improve that. Again, I'm talking about medical, um, you know, a medical example. I mean, we, we, you can treat pneumonia the wrong way, and you can have, you can treat anything the wrong way, or you can ignore problems, um, and you know, that's that's also helpful to think about what have we ignored. Uh, 
But I think that when we talk about scale, you know, it's important to think about quality, about compassion, about things that are difficult to measure. Um, and the confidence that we can measure the cost and effectiveness of everything is a mistake. You know, it's not a mistake for ideological reasons. Like, I get a student say to me often, um, how come you're against cost effectiveness analysis? I said, what? I'm not against cost effective analysis. I just want our understanding of both cost and effectiveness to be smart, right? I mean, it, it's not easy to understand cost. We don't even understand the difference between cost and price, which, you know, that's pretty basic from what I'm, uh, I'm led to believe. For example, last year in the United States, there was a lot of front page articles in the New York Times about the variation in price for medical services that were commoditized, but they were equivalent. I mean, for example, the same procedure could cost twice the variation of 200% sometimes. To me, that's a reminder of the difference between cost and price. And I thought, well, that'll be good because now people will know that cost and price are not the same thing and have more critical uh, understanding about how hard it is to assess price, much less cost. That, that actually hasn't come to pass yet, that there's been a lot of improvement. I mean, in, in other words, that transparency has not led to a big debate about CEO salaries, right? Posting CEO salaries, people thought that would maybe drop the salaries. On the contrary, it's served to, you know, up them. And again, I don't have an ideological opinion about that. I'm just saying cost is difficult to assess. Effectiveness, again, you know, um, there are, it's a really difficult area. Um, how do we know when something is effective or when it's not? Um, you could say, well, that's obvious, isn't it? It's really not. Anyway, all this to say that those difficult to measure um, recipes, secret sauce, whatever, include compassion, solidarity, and, and I think that's what brings people into a warehouse like this on a Sunday afternoon. People, do care about the notion of justice, equity, the notions. And uh, I think that's, you see that across the boards from all kinds of backgrounds. And I, we have to draw on that. Tonight, I'll be talking about global health equity as if it were something. And we need to make it something. And it has to be open to everybody, not just physicians and nurses and other front lines of providers, but people who make the stuff we need, who know how to do supply chain, who can ship it, who can have feedback loops to help us be better at the effectiveness of what we're trying to do. Um, and, and I think that's a, a lifetime's work, not just for you and me, but for you know, increasingly large numbers of people who understand that um, everybody should be concerned with these issues. I mean, it's not a, something to be uh, done by people who consider themselves experts. And that, that's, what, that's what our critique is of, of cost effectiveness is meant, not as a critique against the notions, but say, look, everybody needs to understand this a little bit more, otherwise we're gonna make mistakes. Now that is a very long-winded answer, but the, you're asking me these big philosophical questions. He does that, doesn't he? Everything you said after that was a good question, I didn't really care about it, that was, I was just relieved. <laughs> um, but one of the things I think for the, um, we do have a lot of folks who are on the front lines of public health here in Santa Barbara. Um, people who go out and do street rounds and people who work in the neighbor, Santa Barbara neighborhood clinics, um, which has gone through a very difficult financial time. At the same time, we've been so fortunate to build a world-class hospital in a, in a relatively small town, you know, tale of two cities, right? Um, but. So this, this cleavage that exists within society, I think, is, um, exists in Santa Barbara, exists in California, exists in the United States, where we're, I mentioned to Paul, that we're now working extensively in all 50 states with the places that people go if they are poor. And the quality of care is actually very good by peer-reviewed studies. You know, it's not ghetto medicine. These are places that Stanford University said it's actually better. The primary care that you get at a uh, federally qualified health center is um, you know, better than you would get at a randomly selected group of private primary care providers. Um, so you know, it's, a, it's a good thing that people don't know about. Um, but 
you know, you're known as kind of a leading AIDS doctor in international, but you're also a professor and doctor at Harvard. So could you talk for a bit about what you see um, as crossing board, what, what the differences are when you go internationally, how, what are the commonalities and, and similarities, and are, are we in this weird tailspin in our own debate, political debate, that is just way off track, because you've got a lot of other points of references in different places that might inform us. Um, well, you know, I, I think that when you are, you're working, um, let's just say internationally, because um, it, it is internationally. I mean, there is a, I, there is, there are nation states. Their borders are disputed. As anybody who reads the uh, New York Times and thinks about the two countries, I just, I went from Russia to the United States. So if you work internationally, um, I think you do learn a lot about the how how insular and again rhetorical and difficult the American debates can be. Like you said, it's um, it, it's it's sometimes painful. They see it seems uh, you know too partisan. You know, I believe you were implying that um, in in a lot of the circles that. We move in uh, as partners in health or as um, academic physicians involved in service to the poor. There's actually a really interesting discussion going on right now about universal health care, which in my conversations has not been a polemic and difficult discussion. Again, if you can go to Thailand and uh, be around medical education, ed educators from across Asia and other parts of the world, and uh, and here people speak rather matter of fact. Okay, how do we get to? They, they, there's even an acronym for it already. UHC. That's what everybody inside those circles saying. UHC, 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 universal health care. Um, and it's not that there it is has been achieved, but it's that's the pretty much agreed upon goal. A few, uh, maybe, and I, again, I'm, I'm talking about the circles you mentioned. Physicians, many of them academic physicians. Um, and this was a, a conference um, that is held regularly in, in Thailand, but it's really academic physicians. Um, that's what the discussion was this year. Um, and uh, that would not have happened 10 years ago, I don't think. I'm sure there were people who were thinking about it. In fact, I. Saw, just saw someone here on the way in who reminded me that we last met at a conference uh, in Cuba uh, probably 15 years ago. I don't remember uh, the date where the discussion was, was about uh, universal health care. You know, it seemed like an abstract theoretical debate to, in many countries in the world. But that's, that's what I think is going on more and more is people are trying to say, how do we, how do we build a social safety net? Put it this way. The leading cause of falling from poverty into destitution in the world, in most studies, is catastrophic illness. You know, I, I, and this makes it, this will make it more vivid, and I won't be theoretical, uh, or professorial, or dull, or boring. <laughs> um, when I was a medical student, you know, your mother always tells you, look both ways before you cross the street. You don't listen to your mother, you get problems, right? I walked right in front of a car, and uh, I was 27 years old and a Harvard medical student. And I got taken by ambulance first to one hospital, the Mount Auburn Hospital, and then transferred by ambulance again to the Mass General Hospital. Couldn't walk with that unaided for six months. You know, pushed back my clinical rotations, et cetera. And people would say to people said to me, "Wow, that must have been a really humbling experience, or really instructive." And I thought, uh, actually, no, it was really quite banal. I never was frightened. I never thought your family is going to go down for this, right? Your family, your brothers and sisters, your you know your widowed mother is going to lose her everything, and your brothers and sisters are going to have to drop out of school. And yet that is what happens when there's no safety net. And so 
on the one hand, there are all these ideological discussions, which I, I don't have a lot of energy for them. They, I find them enervating and not too much fun. Right? Everybody's yelling and raising their voices. On the other hand, whatever we call it and wherever we're from, I'm from an NGO called Partners in Health and another one called Harvard Medical School, right? They don't have any obligation to provide universal health care, but we should all be involved in thinking about safety nets for people who are living in, you know, in poverty. And again, it's scary to me that if I had been in a lot of places where I've worked, Haiti, right down the list, either I wouldn't have received care or it would have immiserated uh, my family. And there's got to be a way, we've got all this, this brain power and passion, there's got to be a way to remove some of that. Now, I, all this to rehabilitate it in a way, I think it's good to have academic uh, medicine involved in this work. I think it's a good thing. Um, and not because I you know, have some absurd reverence for academic institutions. I think the, 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 the goal of them is to generate new knowledge and to reflect, you know, to figure out how, this is academic medical centers, is to uh, generate new knowledge as you're providing service delivery. And I think that's a good, good thing for all of us, whether, whether we're involved you know, directly or not. And, uh, and I think we all have to struggle with, um, with these questions of you know, how much vulnerability do we want to tolerate uh, for, the, for the sick and the poor. Now, again, direct relief has moved lots of stuff to us, not just in Haiti, but in Rwanda and Malawi, and, uh, and uh, Malawi especially. But Haiti, for me, is a special case. And uh, here's a chance, I'll say it tonight to a, uh, the broader audience. Haiti, is a, is a, is a, there's a clarity there. We launched this hospital in Mirabale, just you know, one of several, but our flagship hospital, at about the same time as the Boston Marathon bombings. Right? And there is a reason that no one who got to a hospital in Boston died. And that is that they, they you know, again, that's why I told the story about walking in front of a car. There's a reason that I, you know, can walk now and didn't, uh, you know, and that is there was a medical s safety net, at least for people in proximity. Whereas in the earthquake in 2010, as all of you know, um, huge numbers of people died in Haiti, not because of the size of the earthquake, which was bad enough, but because there was no medical safety net. And that requires things like operating rooms and surgeons who, and, and anesthesiologists and stuff. And not just that, people who are going to take care of the injured, no matter whether they can pay or not. So again, even if you don't want to have an ideological discussion about universal health care or, you know, because I, again, I find them a little bit uncivil and rude, <laughs> the, the discussions, I mean, not the people who are having them. I mean, I would never insult a person. Um, that was to make you guys laugh. Even if you don't want to have the discussion in those terms of universal health care, Haiti in 20, 2010, it's just like laid out there clearly. Now, we knew this inside Haiti before, and people at DRI are supporting it. Or um, they, you know, you knew that. Why would you be half of the mission that you have? But I think a lot of people had to stop and say, wow, you know, if we don't have a healthcare system uh, and institutions that can train physicians and nurses and managers and supply chain people and provide high quality care based on need, then we're not, Haiti's not going to break that cycle of poverty and disease. And again, that's been a hard sell. Even among our, our supporters, we say, well, it's, why build a giant medical center in the middle of central Haiti? I mean, there are other priorities. And that, whereas the question would be, how do we build a giant medical center where it's needed and also address other priorities? And, and that's been a big struggle for us and, w and why it's good to have, like, it's like solidarity is great, pragmatic, pragmatic solidarity is even better. Lo you know, love is great, unconditional love and support is even better.
right? And that's what we need, I think, uh, in this work. And we're not gonna, I'm not going to get that only in an academic medical center. I'm not going to get that only in a, uh, you know, an NGO that's involved in service delivery. It's, it's this coming together in partnership, I think, that's going to you know, make a big difference. Um, anyway, that's also my way of saying thank, thank you for the support for Haiti post-earthquake, and specifically to Direct Relief for taking so seriously this really grand ambition to build a you know, world-class medical center in Haiti, not something that was designated as the appropriate technology or the cost effective. You know, this, we said, no, what if the standard of care is the same, whether you're poor or you're rich, whether you're insured or you're uninsured, the standard of medical care? And that, that is a hard sell in, in some circles, but not so much in this one. But, you know, one of the things I've learned is that he who or she who defines the issues wins. You know, if you can, um, if it's in the United States and, and we're an unhealthy society and someone can define it, that's an insurance problem. That's because our health insurance, pro then it's an insurance discussion, right? Um, in an international, uh, in, as an infectious disease doctor, I think Paul, uh, many of you may know that, uh, in the 80s, when AIDS, the scourge of AIDS kind of started killing people, um, it, was, it was prevention versus treatment. I, you know, these people are gone. We, you can either prevent it or can treat it. And there was one person who said, uh, that's about the stupidest thing I've ever heard. With infectious disease, um, prevention is treatment. And that was Paul Farmer. He's then gone on to um, multi-drug resistant uh, TB. This is something that it, um, microbes don't care who you are, or how rich or where you live, they're going to get you. It's an issue. You define an issue and that the bigger, the smaller wheels of partners in health have uh, turned on the flywheel and engaging the bigger wheels of government. Recently you had an article in the Washington Post that kind of reminded us yet again, here in our own country, um, there's something coming down the pike and that would be hepatitis C and we have a choice to make. So first of all, congratulations on defining an issue differently than it had previously been defined and uh, to the benefit of literally millions of people now who would have been in the, um, uh, the, if prevention had won and treatment had been divorced, would have just died in an effort to lean into the prevention. In a tragic loss it would have been for those who made that decision. But first of all, thank you for doing that. And what else do you see needing to be redefined? I mean, hepatitis C is a big one, Washington Post uh, article, but are there other things that, need, that you're thinking about that the current definition isn't working? Well, first of all, thank you, Thomas, for that's a very, you know, that's generous. Uh, it is generous of you to, to remember. Remembering, remembering is good, you know, and uh, I, I, pre I appreciate that for all kinds of reasons that are probably a little bit cheap, meaning personal. Um, well, I'll just go back to the example. You know, what's coming down the pike? What's a, you know, there's a, there's, there are all these specific ways of looking at it, right? And I think what we do often is to have a kind of pet project, which is okay, right? I mean, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, I am interested in this problem for this reason, right? And uh, so whatever the problem is and whatever the reasons, I, I have no critique of that at all. So I, I have, you know, I have friends who've been involved in this work for all sorts of reasons, this work being, being involved in some health issue for all kinds of reasons. And I, I think we should encourage that. We should encourage everybody to find a way of engaging um, in these big problems of health and well-being. And there are lots of ways to do it. That's, you know, the, 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 the real leader um, of, as you said, of liberation theology, he, he likes to say, well, there's a thousand ways to serve the poor. And, uh, and, and I think he's right. And on the other hand, are there ways of assessing what the ranking priorities of people living in poverty face? And I think the answer is for sure, right? Look at the burden of disease and look at what's getting ignored, the gap. Right? So if you do that, um, for example, if you do that in a place, like a nation state, like I can, I, I can t tell you um, if we were to draw a boundary around 
you know, any county, state, nation, whatever the term may be, we could say, oh, this is the biggest problem for people living in poverty in that place. And that kind of assessment, some people would call that epidemiology, it doesn't, you know, there are lots of different ways of looking at it. You, you know, uh, 20 years ago, already in, in many places in the world, uh, AIDS was the leading infectious killer of young adults. AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria were up at the top of the list. Um, and so that burden of disease analysis, I think, is very helpful. Um, and then gap. And as you mentioned, some people were saying, well, you know, it's no, there's no point in worrying about people who already have AIDS. Of course, you wouldn't say that if your own child were sick, right? You wouldn't say, ah, there's nothing, nothing we can do about, you know, this kid with leukemia. They're already sick with leukemia. We don't say that, you know, about our own kin or friends. And I think it's, it's good to use that burden of disease model and also to be, you know, to keep, you know, fighting the, the notion that some things are untreatable. Is that really a useful term that some illnesses are treatable and untreatable? Probably not. Um, it's pro probably not helpful even when you're looking at illnesses for which our therapeutic capacity is very limited. Um, so I, I, I think to, to, if you would say, here are five things we can do to, to look at the problems coming down the pike. One is, what's the leading cause of death for, let's say, someone who's 20 years old in the world, in the poor world, or in the places where I work? Probably trauma, road trauma. So are we saying, we, you know, and, and, and maybe that's why I'm thinking about that. Imagine if someone had said, when I was 27, you know what? He already walked in front of the car. His mother told him not to, right? Prevention is better than care. He should have, you know, that's bad logic. We would never do that, you know. And nobody did it to me. They're like, what can we do to help you, save you, you know? And, and, and they did, you know. And again, even if I weren't going to die because I got hit by a car and broke the bones in my leg, I still wasn't going to walk again, you know, if I didn't have some help. So I think, you know, trauma, when you say trauma, uh, there are lots of meanings of the word trauma. I mean, I, I'm thinking of Rwanda, of course. There's the trauma of being involved in something horrible like the genocide. It causes injuries that are difficult to see. They cause wounds that are difficult to see. Uh, and then there's trauma, like being injured. You know, a landmine, a machete, a car hits you. Um, uh, something like the Boston Marathon. There's all kinds of trauma. We have to tackle that going forward and not ever let someone say, too difficult, too complex, too expensive, right? Black hole. You, how many times have people said to me and to many of us working at Parkinson's Health, hospitals, black holes, you don't need them. Now, I've learned over the years to be very, to bite my tongue because I'm thinking, you don't need one right now, but when you do, I'll be sure and remind you, you said poor people don't need them. I would never do that, by the way. But sometimes things like that do cross my mind. So going forward, think about, let's think about trauma. Another is, you know, it's hard to treat cancer. It's hard to treat cancer in Santa Barbara. And it's hard to have cancer. Um, but don't think for a minute that cancer is not a ranking cause of death in the developing world. It is. Uh, it is a huge killer. In fact, the majority of all cancer deaths today occur in the low and middle income countries. So clearly, again, burden and gap. That, that, that kind of analysis will lead us to looking not only what are the biggest killers, or, and you know, it's not just killers, well, it causes suffering, right? We, there are illnesses that cause enormous suffering, but don't usually, aren't usually lethal, right? Or aren't quickly lethal. And I mentioned hepatitis C in, that, in, the, uh, in the Washington Post just because I knew that something really interesting was happening now, and you were good enough to mention it. And I realized that most of my medical students didn't know, much less my friends who weren't in, you know, involved in medical care. And that is hepatitis C, which was discovered, by the way, you know, it's, it's only recently, you know, I was in medical school. It's not, you know, 
that's not that long ago, 20, 1986, um, the year before I was I disobeyed my mother and didn't look both ways. But now it's going to be curable. We've got new treatments, new therapies. So what's our plan to address hepatitis C among people living in poverty, whether that be... By the way, hepatitis C probably causes more deaths in the United States than HIV. It's those lines crossed. That's official U.S. data, that hepatitis C-associated deaths have surpassed HIV-associated deaths in the United States. And I bet you it's happened in Russia, too, although there's been you know, a big spike in new HIV infections in some of the places where we've been working. So I think that way of looking forward, what's the burden of disease, what's getting ignored, will steer us towards problems like cancer in the developing world, illnesses for which we now have treatments that we didn't 10 years ago, hepatitis C. There were treatments, but they just weren't very good. Again, cost and effectiveness. And then uh, some of the really tough problems, mental illness and trauma are two that come to mind. And again, we need common cause from people who are supporters of the work, who are not going to say, oh, well, you know, you should be doing this, not that. I get that a lot, um, in, and uh, we get that a lot, you know. And I'm sure you get it a lot, too, in the sense of people saying, oh, you, know, you have to really focus your attention down on a certain problem. Well, that's good, right? But you need to make sure that other people are involved in, in picking up the slack, you know. Like I was being asked uh, just about water security today from some acquaintances. Look, Partners Health doesn't want to get in the water security uh, trade, you know, whatever it may be, humanitarian work, but somebody's got to be doing that so that we don't have to focus on it in, in a place like Haiti. In Russia, it's not really a big problem. Haiti, huge problem. And uh, so you need to build these partnerships. Each of the problems that I mentioned, I didn't mention a million, I just mentioned four, I think are going to be serious challenges in the years going forward. And, uh, and we're going to need a lot more people on board as supporters. And that's why I'm going to use this term tonight, later on, um, global health equity. Because that's the shortest version we could find of it, global health equity. And a guy, a guy named Bill Fagey, who was head of the CDC and worked on the smallpox eradication, and I met him through um, uh, the years um, in the 90s. Uh, at the CDC. He later became a chief advisor uh, to the Gates family as they were trying to start their foundation. But he used that term and he said, if you think about it, this is a, uh, in a conversation with me and Jim Kim and later others at Partners Health that co-affiliate all, global health equity. You don't want it to be international health and we knew that was true, right? What does that mean? There are problems inside Santa Barbara like you just said, right? So it's, 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 it's not international, right? There are poor people living in rich countries and poor people living in poor countries. So that's the global part. And then health, pretty straightforward, right? It's, it's hard to say that we're not interested in health. We should all be. And then finally, equity. You know, that's the justice part. And instead of having a laundry list of, you know, here are the top 10 problems for the coming five years, in country X, Y, or Z, all interesting exercise to do. It's really global health equity. We gotta, we're gonna take on what's causing the biggest problem and we're gonna do, look how it's affecting the poor and who's ignoring that. And I, I think that'll be steering enough to get us through the next 10, 15, 20, however many years. For me, I hope that's gonna be the rest of my life and for many of you, in one way or the other, it will be the rest of yours too.